Welcome to HBR Quarantine. I'm Adi Ignatius, co-host of the show, along with my colleague, Josh Macht. What a week this has been. We created this show about six weeks ago to deal with COVID-19 and its fallout on business and the world of work. Now there's a second issue that demands our attention. The killing of an African-American man, George Floyd, in Minneapolis just over a week ago was a tipping point for many Americans. It was yet another reminder of the casual and brutal racism that is still a reality in the United States. For the protesters that have taken to the streets in dozens of cities, the message is clear. No longer. Something needs to change. It needs to change now. This is not just a problem of police tactics, although that's certainly part of the issue. It's a problem with racism, inequality, and the unwillingness of individuals and institutions to truly commit themselves to doing something about it. It's tied in with COVID-19 as well, which has hit people of color disproportionately hard. We're going to focus today in particular on what businesses and executives can do to try to correct the inequality and injustices that have lit a fuse in America. There are plenty of us who think we're on the right side of the history, who think we have a good heart and are doing our part to help achieve some small bit of progress. But if we're honest with ourselves, most of us know we're coming up short. This is the kind of moment that shocks us out of complacency that forces us to ask ourselves, what can we do to truly make a difference? We have a special guest today to talk about these issues. She is Laura Morgan Roberts. She's a professor at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. She's the author of several books, including Race, Work, and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience. So I'm going to bring her in in a second, and I also invite everyone who's watching to submit their own questions as well in the comment box. We'll try to get to as many of your questions uh, as possible. But Josh, let me turn it to you first. What are your own thoughts on this moving well, and troubling week? First off, Adi, thanks so much, and thanks for those opening words. Um, I mean, I think like you, I have been feeling just so much frustration, um, and you can't help but feel that when you see these protesters and the cries for justice and equality. And it's hard to see so many people in real pain. It's hard to see innocent people murdered in front of our eyes. And then at the same time, I think I had these emotions of, well, you know, what right do I have to speak? Um, what right do I even have to these emotions? Because I, you know, I haven't endured the, the sort of dehumanization that so many others have lived with for so long. And, um, and, and you just feel that come through. And I was feeling this kind of sense of like, you know, what, what, what can I do, you know, or, or what can I, what should I say? And that's when, um, you know, we published Laura's words on our site and I went to them and I'll, I'll quote them directly because it really did, it just struck me and I'm, you know, eager to talk more about this, but she says on the site, you know, for people not directly impacted by these events, the default response is often silence. Many whites avoid talking about race because they fear being seen as prejudice. So they adopt strategic colorblindness instead, but no one has the perfect words to address atrocities in our society. And then she goes on to quote Martin Luther King's words, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. The silence of our friends kind of really hit me and I felt like, yeah, wait, this is not the moment to be silent. This is a moment to engage. This is a moment to really engage in a difficult conversation. Uh, and yeah, we've come up short. You're exactly right, Adi. But you know, if we really do yearn for a world or a culture or a society or a company or a neighborhood or whatever that really embraces each other's differences in a meaningful way, uh, you know, then it's time to engage in a different kind of conversation. And then, you know, of course, not just today, but what is what are the actions going forward? And it's made me think a lot about that. And I think this conversation gives rise to all those issues. I'm, I'm really eager to talk with our guests about all of this and more. And then, of course, you know, from here forward, where are we going? How do we how do we walk in a positive direction together to get where we, we really should be going? So let's get to it. Yeah, let's bring her in. So if you just joined us, this is HPR Quarantined. Um, our guest today is Laura Morgan Roberts, professor at University of Virginia's Darden School of Business, author, uh, editor of several books, including Race, Work, and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience. She's also the co-author of an article that uh, Josh just mentioned in Harvard Business Review this week 
called U.S. Businesses Must Take Meaningful Action Against Racism. So again, I invite everyone watching to submit their own questions as well. But Laura, I, I want to welcome you to the program. Thank you for giving us the time. And I just I need to ask you, how are you holding up um, in this uh, you know really really tough week? Thank you so much for having me, uh, Adi and Joshua, and especially thank you for asking that question. Um, it's certainly been a trying week, uh, but it also has uh, deepened a sense of personal and I think uh, community conviction around finally picking up the mantle, um, passing it around, and each of us doing our part to create a more just and equitable society. And in that, recognizing that um, you know, it, it's not just about an organizational policy or a mission statement alone, um, but it's really about transforming the hearts and the minds of people within our organizations and in our communities who then have to enact these policies and practices that will help us to move forward. So, you know, it's 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 sobering to see what's happened. It's sobering to feel what's happening. And it's sobering to hear the voices of so many people from a wide variety of backgrounds, but especially Black professionals who are just exasperated um, in the context of our conversation today and reinforcing what we've been hearing from the research for many, many years, which is, you know, we are so tired. When are we really going to make progress? Um, when are we actually going to take this work seriously and have some partnership and allyship in doing the work? So I'm really grateful for this forum today that we're able to have this conversation and come to the table together and think about how we find a way forward. You know, Laura, you, you point to uh, the vice provost at the University of Michigan, uh, Sellers, who um, writes about the exhaustion, the feelings of exhaustion that you just point out um, that I think are real. And and in your piece, you you talk about how this conversation about race has has really moved from questions about marginalization in the workplace to this much bigger debate around the deep, enduring stain of racism in America. And how, how do we handle that? Yeah, so my co-author of that piece, Ella Washington, as well as the dozens of contributors um, to our edited volume, Race, Work, and Leadership, all want to communicate two important um, dynamics around racism. The first said racism is not just an artifact of our past but it also permeates our present. So we're actively participating in and co-constructing a system that reinforces a racial hierarchy. And that racial hierarchy is producing experiences of inclusion and exclusion, of marginalization or advancement. So it's a much more detailed conversation than our, our DNI initiatives often take up around just bring your whole self to work or just be authentic. It's really about reevaluating the structures and the practices that are in place that have led to this systematic. Um, dehumanization, Joshua, to use the word that you used earlier, mm -hmm. of members of the organization. So that's the first piece. Racism is not just past, but it's also present. And the third is that racism is not just out there in the streets, but it's also in here. So Ella and I wanted to communicate that there's a, an ongoing link and, and fluidity between what we see happening in terms of the racial strife and concern and injustice that's happening in the streets and people's experiences of race and racism within the workplace. It's ironic that this is happening in a moment in history when we are, uh, millions of us are and have been practicing physical distancing. So instead of walking into our office buildings every day and metaphorically checking race at the door, we're signing on to Zoom every morning from our own environments, from our personal homes, from our communities. And I think that's also signaling to us the fact that what happens out there in our communities, in our neighborhoods, it affects our experiences in the workplace every day. Laura, the last bit of really grand national soul searching on this issue was maybe three years ago. Um, 
the white supremacist rally in Virginia. You're at the University of Virginia, so you you had a front row seat to that. You know, did anything enduring, did anything lasting come out of that national moment? Is there anything to to learn from now? Yeah, well, um, I paid close attention to what was happening in Charlottesville at that time um, as an alum, actually. Uh, undergrad, class of 96, um, wah wah I was remembering my own graduation walk down that lawn and how meaningful it was to be able to celebrate earning a degree from an institution where one of my ancestors had served as a cook and seeing this long journey, intergenerational journey, between a position of impression of oppression and an opportunity to be able to grow and, and uh, grab onto my full potential. So I had that sense of hope and optimism. Um, and what we saw in, uh, in the white supremacist rallies on that very same space was a stark contrast um, to that message and that feeling. So I actually was not on the faculty of UVA at the time. I was on the faculty of Georgetown McDonough, which is engaging in a parallel process of reflection about its own history and legacy around the sale of enslaved Africans to fortify the economic standing of that institution. Uh, so what was significant in that moment was that um, business leaders uh, did start to speak up and make public statements about racial tolerance and the fact that they were responsible for this social justice issue in the same ways that they had been taking up the mantle around environmentalism and homelessness and some other social justice issues that um, that were receiving a lot of attention. Uh, but it wasn't the same widespread response. And it, um, it in some ways petered out. So it's a bit different now in terms of the scale and scope. You know, the question is not, have you responded um, and made a public statement? You know, if you're a business leader or a university leader, but when is your statement coming and how far will you go with your statement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really true. The, the other thing we saw yesterday um, was all the social media activity around yeah. Blackout Tuesday. Yeah, so I'm curious because so many individuals, right, and companies showed their solidarity posting black images. Does that, um, what does that do? Is that is that political correctness at play um, or, or what comes of that? It's a step. You know, I don't want to be dismissive of individual and institutional acts of courage because we're all at a different stage in this trajectory, right? So it's a step. Um, for many people to even say the word race, uh, much less to display a symbol that publicly supports their belief or their espoused belief that black lives do and should matter. Um, and they're committed to promoting equity and justice for all racial groups. Uh, so I, I don't mean to sort of diminish that or make light of it, but I think the question that people are asking today, right, on the day that followed the blackout is, so now what? You made the statement, you've acknowledged the harm that is taking place. Have you begun to acknowledge your own role in creating or perpetuating these systems? And are you willing to invest in the hard work that is required for us to truly experience that ROI from the business case of diversity. Because with the business case for diversity, there's a promise that there's going to be a net gain from increasing representation and enhancing inclusion in organizations. But it doesn't come without some measure of conflict and discomfort, um, a redirection of resources toward promoting issues um, and promoting people that are working on behalf of equity, justice, and inclusion. So it's about a long haul. It's not about a day. Um, but I, I also don't want to diminish the fact that when companies are making these statements and individuals are making these statements, when Robert Sellers uses his platform at the University of, of Michigan, my alma mater as well, which has a contested, publicly contested history around 
-hmm. how proactive they have been in promoting racial inclusion. You know, we should be mindful. We should we should pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. Um, again, this is HBR Quarantine. If you're just joining us, our guest is Laura Morgan Roberts. If you have questions for her, we're talking about uh, racism and inequality in society and particularly in the workplace. So if you have questions, put them in the comment box. I'm going to actually get to a question now. I, 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 I want to give a little preamble, which is to confess that you know the places that I've worked in my life, including my current employer, we do not have a very diverse workforce. We tell ourselves the usual things that are profession tends to skew overly white, that we try hard um, at uh, hiring a diverse um, staff, but that it doesn't seem to work out. Um, I know that's not an adequate explanation. And uh, the question, though, that I'm going to take is similar. It's from uh, Lauren in New York, who, uh, oh, sorry, this is from Jen from Portland, um, which is, you know, so, so what do you recommend for business professionals to move beyond dialogue to actionable reform in the workplace on these issues? So what do I recommend um, for professionals? It's each professional, um, again, needs to search head, hands, and heart. So number one, um, head, you need to commit to a process. We need to commit to a process of lifelong learning about uh, the ways in which race has fundamentally shaped our economy also, the ways in which racial inclusion and demonstrations on um, in service of racial inclusion have advanced the democracy of the United States and the democracy of, of our workplaces. So we want to come to a greater understanding so that we can interpret what's happening within a broader context, get outside of the sphere of our own individual experience, and really try to step back and understand how all of these factors are interrelated. Um, when Courtney McClooney, um, Aaron Thomas, and Michelle Kim and I wrote a piece about the impact of, of race on COVID uh, that came out in Harvard Business review last week, that was really our goal, was to raise the awareness of this broader system of interdependencies that were making certain individuals more vulnerable um, to the toxicity that exists within our society than others. And the APA has declared that racism, like coronavirus, is also a pandemic. And there are certain individuals who are more vulnerable. So that's your head, the acknowledge. The second is the affirm. That's your heart. It's affirming the right to personhood. It's being able to sit and listen non-judgmentally to someone else's truth and someone else's experience, even if you hadn't seen it before, and not become defensive when you hear them speaking about a pattern of experiences that they have had, maybe even working with you and your teammates within your own organization. Um, but I think what the question here is, is really get, around Jen, is really getting to the hands piece, which is the action. So what are the range of actions? Oh my goodness, where to start? I mean, every time I open up my browser, I see another list of seven five things you can do to promote <laughs> racial justice. So I, I, I say that with all humility and offering, I'll throw out a couple, but oh my goodness, once we start asking the question, I bet we can discover so many things that we've never done. But they range from you know, company investments toward um, racial justice organizations. It, it's company divestment. Uh, from organizations that don't actively promote racial justice. It's about partnerships with stakeholders who hold similar values and are aligned and about reconsidering um, and perhaps terminating some partnerships with stakeholders who are indicating that they don't hold those same kinds of values. So that's on a macro level. Um, and if you have that strategic decision-making power over your portfolio of resources, you can make those kind of decisions. But we also know there are a lot of team leaders and middle managers who may not have that same span of control or, or, or responsibility. And so they're wondering what they can do on a day-to-day -day basis. And those kinds of actions range from just stop starting out a conversation in the same way that you did today, Adi and Joshua, like, you know, gosh, a lot is happening. Want to acknowledge that. How are you doing with all of this? Here's how I'm feeling. Here's how I'm processing. Is there anything I can do to be supportive? You would be amazed if you ask people about their experiences and what they're going through and what they need to see changed in your local environment. 
they will feel safe enough and secure enough to share those suggestions with you. You know, as long as they're guaranteed that they won't be held or penalized for being disruptive or an agitator or, or threatening. So that's the last piece is when people do speak out, your role as an advocate is to help buffer, to help protect them. When we think about what happened with George Floyd, you know, what among so many other things is, is tragic is the number of bystanders who were there, who actively participated and or observed and didn't intervene in that moment. Um, when these kinds of things happen in the form of a microaggression, but you know it could be career ending if it doesn't, you know, if it's not corrected or addressed, here's where you step in and you sort of clarify and you call people to consciousness. Wait, did you just characterize him as being threatening? Did you just say he was intimidating? Because I, I thought he was just giving you feedback on your work. Um, you know, may, maybe we need to think about how we're framing this again, because I find his feedback to be to be quite valuable. And, and I don't find his enthusiasm to be intimidating at all. You know, it's those moments, very, very subtle. But those are the opportunities that allow us to start to move change forward. Yeah, and I mean, you're you're pointing to a lot there, Laura, especially around being, you know, a systematic approach to looking at their, uh, especially for a lot of leaders who, you know, are looking at big organizations with a lot of relationships. I mean, you know, in the article, you talk a little bit about, you know, I think it was the University of Minnesota just cutting ties with the Minnesota police force and that there are, there are things that you really need to go through and be much more, you know, this, this I think gets at your point about investment in time. You know that this is going to be a prevalent issue that you are going to be investing for this is it and looking at those relationships right and it's not uh it, it's a it's a much bigger thing than you know any any one seminar or conversation gets at it is and just to add on that really quickly because i know we want to get to more questions but mm -hmm. you know many firms have cut their dei budgets um really starting with the recession of 07 08 um, and haven't sort of rebounded those in the same way or with the same degree of fervor. In recent years, after two terms of um, President Obama's administration, many firms also um, started to kind of declare victory around the race issue and shift to other dimensions of inclusion that are a bit more palatable. And some of the leading firms that are publishing statements now have in recent years dismissed or eliminated the position of chief diversity officer entirely. You know, so when we don't have those structures in place, it's very hard to commit to doing this long-term work. Yeah. So let me, th there are a few questions that have come in that are really around a theme, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase, but there's a, a question from Angie from Minneapolis-St. Paul, from Christy from Norwich, New York, and Cheryl from Washington, D.C. And basically, they're all asking, you know, wh what do you do if your company doesn't take a public stand or doesn't acknowledge what's going on? You know, if they're not, I mean, you talked about how a lot of companies are pumping it out and whether it seems yeah. like window dressing or the real deal. But what if your company isn't acknowledging what's going on? Mm -hmm. what, what, what should an employee do in that situation? Well, it depends on the employee, right? <laughs> it depends on that employee's sphere of influence. Quite honestly, it also depends on that employee's risk profile. Uh, we recognize that it is risky to lead this work and to be a leading voice of this work. We know from research by Johnson and Heckman uh, that was published a few years ago in Harvard Business Review that when white men are diversity champions, their careers do not take a hit. Now, they don't get a boost. Nobody actually gets a boost. You don't do diversity work for popularity, but at least their careers don't take a hit when they take a lead in championing this work. When racial and ethnic minorities and women champion diversity work, you see then a follow-up um, impact or lowering of their performance evaluations. So it depends, again, on the individual's risk profile and their sphere of influence within the organization. Um, and I, I would advise uh, different tactics based on that. If you feel, and I often like to speak to the person who feels that they are on the front line and they have the smallest voice and no one's really listening to what they have to say, no one really cares about what they have to say, is there one person that you can talk to who has a little bit more power than you? 
Can you send over an example of something that you thought was very well worded and explain why it was meaningful to you? Go on LinkedIn. I can't get through my news feed without seeing a million examples. You can find them too. Find one that you think is a positive example that's relevant for your organization or industry and share that with a few people. And just explain from your perspective why you thought that that was meaningful or useful and it gives people something to work with. If you come at it from a place of blame and judgment, that says you haven't said anything and, you know, this is, you know, without offering any suggestions or practical um, uh, practical guidance uh, for what you'd like to hear, then the person on the other side of the of the conversation might shut down. It's it's unfortunate that we're in this space around race. I'm not justifying and legitimating it, but we have enough evidence from 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 our data to support that when people feel that um, they're being accused of racism they go into a defensive mode and it becomes really difficult to listen and engage in that space. The, some of what you're talking about, Laura, gets at the, uh, is embedded in the, this, this concept of anti-racist. And I was wondering if you could help us with, you know, what that means and how companies, um, you know, really do develop that identity around it. Right. So I think, you know, what companies have done, and we alluded to this in our piece, is, you know, many companies have anchored themselves in the space of neutrality. And you also mentioned this earlier, mm -hmm. in this space of neutrality, as if either I'm racist or I'm neutral, I'm colorblind, I'm not getting involved, I'm not speaking on it. It's not what that, what that symbolizes then is it's not relevant. Um, I don't see it as relevant to my personal um, lived experience. Uh, whatever problems it's causing uh, are not big enough or significant enough for me to feel that we need to attend to. Um, and so I can remain in what feels safer to me or more comfortable to me in this zone of espoused neutrality. But we know that the neutrality is really complicit, um, that you're then signaling or uh, that this behavior that's taking place is acceptable for you. So anti-racist is coming out positively in ways through your words and through your deeds that dismantle systems of hierarchy that make it more difficult for individuals um, who are black in America and from other racial and minority groups in America to advance within the organization. Being anti-racist means being on the lookout for anything that doesn't pass the sniff test. When you look at a discrepancy between the representation, even within your own organization in terms of the front line and your senior leadership, for instance, being anti-racist is having the courage yeah. to acknowledge and accept that none of us are perfect, that our institutions all have work to do. And so then we're being open and transparent and holding ourselves accountable toward doing that work. I mean, isn't that, I mean, sorry, just very quickly, but the, you said the word courage and it's, as you were speaking, I was thinking it the whole time. I mean, doesn't so much of it rest, you know, as, as we started for those, for so many people who are, haven't had that, the, been in some of these positions on really courage, because it's just so much easier. It's been easier. People haven't done anything. So where's the courage? You know, and the courage is, um, you know, for some people who have always been in their, um, in their safety zone, in their comfort zone, in their safe space, you know, the courage is to step outside of that bubble and have to walk in the metaphorical shoes of somebody who um, expresses a divergent viewpoint, um, calls leadership on some of their actions and, and beliefs. So I want to circle back to, to the prior question about what can you do if your company doesn't make a statement? Well, you know, I was offering some tactics or ways in which a person could speak up, but let's acknowledge that any act of dissent or speaking up in that way and raising questions involves courage and that people who have less power in the organization have had to utilize courage just to navigate every step of their career, going through spaces where they're often treated with doubt. They're facing the same kind of microaggressions 
in the coffee room that Chris Park, that Chris Cooper experienced from Amy Cooper in Central Park. And so they've had to invoke their courage just to keep showing up and pushing forward, staying optimistic and positive and doing the work. Um, and so the courage now shifts to those who haven't had to be as brave in these spaces or put their neck out there um, when these topics come up to make themselves vulnerable, to maybe say something that everybody might not like or might even give them some feedback and say, look, I appreciate that you tried, but let me give you a little bit of feedback on this message. Here's how I think it could have been more resonant. And next time, I think you might want to take this approach before you move forward with making a statement, for, for example. That's all part of the courage that leaders need to take on now. Let me uh, let me go to a couple more questions from the audience. Um, we're getting a lot of good ones. This is some of the things we've been talking about, but a, a slightly different perspective. This is from Neville from Canada. It says, I'm the only black individual in the executive suite in my workplace. So these types of conversations are awkward. And I tend to now be at the center of these conversations. How do I get around the awkwardness and have those conversations? Well, I've, I've heard that so many times, um, and especially in the past week, um, there was a sort of collective sigh among many people in your same position, Neville, who are feeling uh, like they're going to now become the focus or the center of this conversation um, when the conversation should really be focusing on the organization and the patterns and practices that are happening within the organization. Um, so, you know, some of the things that you can do and say in those moments, um, I can only speak for myself. Um, I'm happy to share some resources if you're interested in continuing to learn more about what the experience um, in an organization such as ours might be like. Uh, for people who are in the minority. Um, sure, it's challenging to be the only African-American um, in the room or you know, a senior executive. I, I don't think you're doing anything there but stating the obvious. And so it's okay to name that. Uh, but don't take on sort of the burden or the work of educating, advocating, and most importantly, of comforting your counterparts who are feeling unsettled or uh, maybe even destabilized about what's happening, uh, what's happening right now. You know, it's more about acknowledging and owning your experience, um, but not taking on that extra burden of work. Yep. Let me do, let me do one more. This is Amanda from Maryland. Um, she's asking, how can I explain to those in the All Lives Matter camp yeah. that the hashtag Black Lives Matter does not exclude the lives and rights of others, but rather highlights the disproportionate treatment and violence against people of color. Now, you know, implicit, in that, I think the logic of that explanation is relatively easy to make, but it is it is hard to make with people who don't share your point of view. So I, I how would you how would you answer that? I, I come at it um, two ways and, it you know, it depends on who who. It depends on the context of the conversation, let me say that. So um, sometimes I use metaphors and stories to try to help people to understand more about um, the disparities in the experiences. And so there's one around privilege that has to do with the road trip. So like when I was a kid, my family used to travel from where I grew up in Gary, Indiana, uh, to Hilton Head, South Carolina. Um, which is a layered story in and of itself. Um, but we would go there for the summers. Um, I have an interesting intersection around race, gender, and class. My father is an orthopedic surgeon. We grew up in a working class, largely working class community at the time with Gary, Indiana. But nevertheless, so we would take these road trips um, as a summer vacation to Gary and to, uh, to Hilton Head. Long road trips, took us a couple of days to get there. Imagine that in your family of five, you keep asking, when are we going to get there? All the kids are impatient. Everybody wants to get there. Nobody wants to be in the car forever. But then one person in the car has to use the bathroom. <laughs> so everybody wants to get there, but the one kid has to use the bathroom. 
So all the kids are saying, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? Are we there yet? I'm tired of being in the car. I want to stop and stretch. But one kid, it's obviously more urgent to them than others. And that's a way to think about Black Lives Matter and all lives matter. Yeah, we're all trying to get the same place. Yes, we all want to get there. But the sense of urgency and discomfort is a lot greater for some individuals than others because they don't have access to what they need right now. With the others of us, we would prefer to have more of X, Y, Z, but we're not in the same state of deprivation. So, so that's one response um, to the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. I mean, there are academic um, responses to that as well, which is just, well, let's, let's look at the data. I agree with you. Fundamentally, all lives matter. I research how to co-create the conditions in which people can activate their best selves and maximize their full potential at work. That's what I want for everybody. That's why I do this work. However, I can't do that without acknowledging the fact that it's easier for some individuals to get there than it is for others. So race isn't just about my personal issues. Race is also about the fact that some of us are trying to get to Hilton Head in a luxury van, and others of us are trying to get to Hilton Head in a clunky vehicle with hardly no gas money. It's a great metaphor, and you've got every one of our listeners now singing Gary, Indiana in their yeah. head. Yeah, so. oh, okay. <laughs> well, there's lots of things to sing. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? audience? Yeah, so this is from Zahara from New York. Um, okay. another tr these are all tricky questions. Uh, <laughs> she says there are only three CEOs in the Fortune 500 that are women of color. Uh, what suggestions? No black have? women, right. Yep, so what suggestions do you have for companies to move large number, a larger number of women of color from middle management to the next level? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll be shorthanded on this one because um, we published a piece uh, with uh, Tony Mayo, Robin Ely, and David Thomas in Harvard Business Review in 2018 called Beating the Odds, where we um, examined the career paths of the very few Black women graduated from Harvard Business School and ascended into the C-suite in various industries. And so we talked there about what their personal strategies were and how they got there by being more authentic, by ex using emotional intelligence, by being agile and flexible in how they navigated their careers and by having access to the mentors and the sponsors that they needed. We wanted to include that second piece because it was an as important part of the equation. Yes, the individual has to bring their skills, their human capital, their desires, but they also need that support, that advocacy, that sponsorship to help them to move ahead in the firm. So what can you do today? If you are a manager, you're a leader, and you're recognizing that your organization does not reflect society, find someone who doesn't look like you and or doesn't look like the prototypical leader in your organization and bet on their potential. Take a bet on their potential. And nine times out of 10, if you bet on their potential and you invest in their success, they're going to make good on that investment. They'll grow and develop. It doesn't always work out. And then you give them the high quality feedback they need. And perhaps at that point you part ways, but it's making the first step to identify and, um, and engage diverse talent. That's going to help to remedy the structural inequalities that we are experiencing in our societies today. Yeah. Um, no, I really like listening to your responses here and maybe we can get to a couple other questions from the audience. Okay. I, I, one, but one thing that I am, I'm curious about it that I wanted to get to was that because of where we started this whole conversation and a lot of the feelings of exhaustion that we talked about. Yeah. Um, and when you couple the issues we're seeing here right now, um, especially with COVID-19, the disparities of how that is hitting um, disadvantaged communities in, in disproportionately mm -hmm. and these things are all combined and they do add up to a, a deep sense of hopelessness. So I was, I was kind of hoping like you could, like, what is, what, what is the case for hope? Well, we know that hope is a lifeline, right? 
Um, and so people will can and will endure some of the most egregious circumstances with the hope in a brighter future. Now, hope is fueled by evidence of progress. Indicators of progress mm -hmm. are that people are no longer getting away with dehumanizing other people, um, brutally, verbally, professionally, or in the streets. It's like when you're the kid who's being bullied in your elementary school, and you try to explain to your to the teachers and the, the principal what's going on, and the principal keeps coming back and saying, oh, well, you know, that's a good kid. I'm sure they didn't mean it. And then the parents come in and try to advocate, my kid's being bullied. The principal and the teachers come back and say, oh, she looks fine to me. She's still getting good grades. She seems to be talking to people out in the schoolyard. So it must be all in your head. Or what is she doing to bring about this kind of behavior or response? I think, you know, if we really want to plant those seeds or reignite those seeds of hope, you know, I agree to you, we're, we're shifting in very quickly into a zone of despair. And that's a dangerous place for us to be as a society. So if we're going to reinvigorate those seeds of hope, you know, we have to turn back to the promises that our leaders of our countries, our leaders of our communities, our leaders of our organizations have made. Uh, Trevor Noah caught, talks about this in terms of the social contract. Um, we have to find a way to reinvigorate the social contract by holding people accountable for their dehumanizing behaviors and beliefs. So we have time maybe just for this one last question. And, and Laura, I guess, you know, as somebody who is hopeful for um, positive change like myself, uh, you know, I worry mostly that this is a moment where there will be a lot of noise and a lot of fanfare, but it could pass and there could be not enough progress. And I think about the Me Too movement, which on the one hand, I think actually accomplished a lot. Uh, I think there's certain behaviors that are not tolerated, that are called out. There are certain figures that have been removed from positions of power. But, you know, you'd be hard pressed to say, well, the world completely changed or the progress has been made as fully as maybe would have thought. So I guess my question is, assuming this is a, a real watershed moment and not just a, a flash in the pan, what would you like to see in, in you know two years from now or sort of five years from now? That, that showed you, yes, we did respond to this moment uh, as individuals, as institutions, as governments, and we made progress. What would you, what would you want to see happen? That's a tough question, Adi. Um, but uh, there's a, a piece that, that, David, uh, that David Thomas and Robin Ely published many years ago around making differences matter that argued that um, we would know when we've reached full inclusion in our organizations and in our institutions when the people who are making the strategic decisions around how we allocate our most precious resources, when they represent the diverse group of stakeholders who have sacrificed for the success of the organization or who continue to fuel and feed the, the success of the organization. So, you know, what I'd like to see, you know, five years from now is I'd like to see more diverse representation in terms of fair, just, and equitable leadership from a wide range of cultural backgrounds, especially and in including Black people um, at all levels of leadership in the government, um, as well as in our other institutions and organizations, such as our Fortune 500 companies. Um, when we studied the alumni of Harvard Business School, we found that relative to their peers, they were actually more educated in entering Harvard Business School and were very often very likely to complete joint degrees. So graduating from Harvard, not just with an MBA, but also an MBA and a law degree. Or, you know, so it, the, the question of, of qualification is, is often a bit of a fluke. Five years from now, I'd like for the conversation to shift away from, we can't find enough 
people who do X, Y, Z to, um, to saying, you know, look, there's an abundance of talent and arts. It's our responsibility to find that talent. And then the third piece in terms of accountability is that, um, you know, if, if we really think that the experiences of black people count, then we will count them. Everything else that we think counts in organizations, we literally count it. We track it. You don't say, I would love us to grow sales in the next quarter without sending a target. You don't say we want to cost cuts without setting a specific target. So whatever is right for any organization, based on where they are in terms of their trajectory of growth and how they sit within their, their sphere of stakeholders, there should be very specific indicators and targets. And the data should be collected systematically on an ongoing basis and analyzed by race, cut down by racial groups. So not lumping diversity and inclusion all into this one bucket of happy talk, but we're really you know, being much more scientific and evidence-based in how we're approaching this work. That's, uh, and my, my follow-up question is, are you, will you come back on our show? <laughs> in five years? <laughs> how about every week? Yeah, exactly. We've got plenty of blocks. You know, as long as there's still work to do, I'll still be here to do it. You right. know, I read that the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. And so, you know, if this is the moment for those of us who are committed to doing the work to just take up the mantle and keep pulling it forward, then um, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm all here for it. <laughs> well, I want to I want to thank you on behalf of myself and Josh and all our all our our viewers uh, for a great conversation. Thank you for being on HBR Quarantine. Thank, thank you. you. Josh, you want to you have the final yeah. word. Yeah, sure. The, the final word. Um, so next week, we uh, if you can follow the balancing ball, we will be um, here again, but on Tuesday um at noon with Jesper Broden who is the CEO of IKEA uh who I'm sure will have a, a pretty uh, interesting conversation around the safety of frontline workers get his perspective on uh, some of the issues that we've talked about today as well as what's happening with the global economy as IKEA is such an integral part of all of that so we're looking forward to that next week we're also um again so thankful for our guest today and we're thankful for all the questions and everybody who joined us uh, have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.